Good evening. I am Michelle McQueen and I'm a community ambassador for ARP Virginia State Office, the city of Richmond. I am so excited to participate tonight and learn more about farming as we welcome the nice weather of spring. Eating healthy fruits and vegetables, as well as planting and growing our own can support a healthy living lifestyle. Please consider volunteering with ARP or learn more about all that we have to offer at our website, arp.org slash virtual VA. Thank you. Welcome, 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 and good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining Asala Richmond's Cultivate Series, Africulture with Farmer and Student of the Earth, Michael Carter, Jr. This, of course, is also sponsored by AARP Virginia. This year's Cultivate Series is centered around the National Sala Annual Black History Theme, Black Health and Black Wellness. We are on webinar two tonight, Africulture, Gardening and Farming Basics. I am excited to be your welcome host for today. So since we have people coming in now, if you can just locate the chat feature at the bottom of your screen, we would love to know where you're from, how you found out about us, and if you found out about us through an organization, please place it in the chat. And this is the fun time when we find out who is joining us from closest to furthest. So let's see what we have. We have, we have someone from Tampa, Henrico, Virginia, Chesapeake, Virginia, Brooklyn, New York. Oh, Maryland, Blacksburg, Virginia, Texas. Wow, this is so exciting. You know, what I found is that since we've been in the pandemic and we might be here in Richmond, Virginia, but we have spread our wings and we have gone through the four corners of the United States. Let's see, Atlanta, Georgia, Detroit, Michigan, New York, Nan. No, oh, Philadelphia, Asala. We got some Asala people here. Thanks for join us, joining us. Newport News by way of Richmond, Virginia. I am loving all of this. Thank you. Keep on Buckingham. That's my that's my my home place. So I love that too. So thank you all for putting that information in the chat and keep on doing it because we want to learn more. My name is Michelle Evans Oliver, and I am the president of the Richmond, Virginia branch of Asala. And for those of you who are wondering, what is ASALA? It is the Association for the Study of African American Life in History. It was founded by Carter G. Woodson, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, in 1915. He is also known for the father of Black history, and which he founded in 1926, which was Black History Week, which eventually turned to Black History Month in 1976. September will mark Asala's 107th birthday. Of course, Asala Richmond was chartered just one and a half years ago, and we are mighty. This year, so far, we've had seven informative webinars, and by the end of March, it will be nine. We have over 25 planned for the year with our Sunday sit-ins, our Cultivate series, and just with partnering with organizations all around the United States. So we have a lot planned for this year. So stick with us during this pandemic and hopefully soon we will be meeting in person or as a hybrid event. I can't wait for that. The links to our upcoming March webinars will be placed in the chat so you can register if you already haven't and you won't be disappointed by these series. Please continue to put the chat in the chat where you're located, how you found out about us, and if an organization directed you to our webinar. That helps us with marketing. It helps us plan our events. Now, if you have comments, please put them in the chat. If you have questions, there is a Q&A feature at the bottom and add it to the Q&A. Putting questions in the chat May, it may, they may get overlooked, and we want to answer as many questions as we possibly, possibly can. So please put the questions in the Q&A. Let's get some more interaction going on here. 
So do we have a poll? Let's see. There should be a poll. So there's a poll here. And if you can answer that, are you a farmer or are you related to a farmer? And have you ever grown a plant, fruit, or vegetable from a seed? Now, I am a gardener and I love to plant so I can answer these questions, but we would love to get more questions answered from you. Thank you so much. So let's get started while you're doing that. Well, we have Michael Carter Jr., farmer and student of the earth, Michael Carter Jr. He is an 11th generation farmer in the United States and is the fifth generation to farm on Carter Farms. His family's century old farm in Orange County, Virginia. He works with Virginia State University, go Trojans, as the Small Farm Resource Center Coordinator for the Small Farm Outreach Program. He sits on the board of directors of the Virginia Association for Biological Farmers, the Virginia Food Systems Council, the Virginia Agrian Trust, and the Virginia Food Shed Capital. He serves as a fellow for the Center for Food Systems and Community Transformation. Michael was recognized as a 2020 Audubon Naturalist Society Taking Nature Black Regional Environmental Champion and the 2020 VSU Small Farm Outreach Agent of the Year. Michael's degree is in agricultural economics from the North Carolina A&T University and has worked in Ghana, Kenya, and Israel as an agronomist and organic agricultural consultant. Whew. One more thing before I go. He presently consults with numerous governments, organizations, and individuals throughout the region and nation on food access, food security and insecurity, market outreach, social and economic equity, and evaluation programs, racial understanding, immersion, history, culture and training, among other areas. Now there's more, but I'm tired of reading his bio and I wanna hear more from him. So I want to just turn this over to Michael Carter Jr. so he can talk about gardening and farming basics. Thank you, Michael, for being here today and thank you for blessing us with your information. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Michelle. I appreciate it. Let me just set my, my screen here real quick. How's everybody doing? I hope everybody's well. I had a great day out in the sun. Uh, it's been a beautiful day and a beautiful week, which means probably next week it's going to be a blizzard. So uh, that's the way things are here in Virginia. I want to welcome everybody to uh, this talk. It's going to be a real comfortable talk this evening. Um, it won't be too lectury. I'll share some things, but this treat me or, you know, I'm probably going to sound like your grandfather, your grandmother. I'm going to try to take y'all back and help you remember some of the things that we used to do when we were younger. Um, again, I'm Michael Carter Jr. with Carter Farms and Alpha Culture. Uh, Carter Farms has been in my family now for almost 110 years, 112 years uh, as of last November. And uh, we're a family farm in central Virginia, in Orange County, Virginia. And I've stated in the bio, my family has been farming and agriculture for the last, I own farm for the last five generations. I'm the fifth generation. And we've been in America since at least seven, 1692, um, which would be about 11 generations. We may go back a little further than that. Uh, some of my family came from the first plantation in America, in the Shirley Plantation in Charles County, Virginia. Uh, we also have a nonprofit called Africulture. Africulture shares the <clears throat> principles, plants, practices, and people of African descent that's contributed to agriculture. To really address the misnomer that when you think about Af agriculture and African Americans, they immediately think of slavery. We want to really uh, highlight the contributions of Africans and African Americans to this culture. Um, and before I begin, as I do in most presentations that I do, uh, we're going to take a moment of silence just to pay respect to those elders and ancestors who came before us, who laid the foundation for us and on, on our behalf. So we're going to take about 30 seconds just to honor them with a moment of silence.
Sarah, Mela, Ashe. So this right here will be the who, what, when, where, why, and how of growing plants and being in nature. And we want to go through all those things to help you better understand about the importance of agriculture, the importance of gardening, the importance of nature, and why we need to be outside more working with nature. Uh, this is really a basic or beginner course. We're not going to go too heavy into what to plant, when to plant, and, and growing production crops, but really to get ourselves back into the context and the mindset of preparing to go back outside and enjoy this outstanding weather and be at one or work to be at one with nature. And almost all my presentations, I usually add a text. And there's a nature text that I think we as a people have, uh, and it's the extra cost uh, being paid by people of African descent, oh, darker skin pigmentation, um, of not being or going outside and gardening as often as we should. Uh, these are conscious, unconscious, or perceived acts of discrimination, bias or prejudice against nature, being outside against the bugs or the insects, or being hot, um, that have, does, or potentially will lead to related physical, emotional, financial, or mental health costs, generally in a negative way on our, on our lives. We are naturally outside people. Um, when living in West Africa, I noticed how much everybody stayed outside. Um, and you could see a difference in their health, uh, in, in every facet of their health, except for probably financial. Uh, but for physical, emotional, and mental health was in superb condition in most cases uh, with those individuals. So we're gonna talk about some of those things today. Some of those things, some of the things we talk about, you probably are aware of, other things may be new to you, and I want you to embrace them. And we have a fact sheet as well to kind of help you explore some of the things that we talk about uh, a little further. All right, the first one is the who. Who? You. All 100 trillion plus of your bacteria and cells. That's what we're talking about. Because you are made up of bacteria and cells. And you have more bacteria and more cells in your body than you do anything else. Uh, and these bacteria and cells have a direct connection to the land that we walk on, the land that we build on, the land that we live on. So that's who I'm talking to. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to those bacteria and cells that's inside you, because that's who you resemble the most. Uh, you know, people say I look cute sometimes, and it's not really me, it's my bacteria that they really are complimenting. The why. And in most cases, people want to know what the why, what's the purpose of doing these things. Uh, and being outside improves your physical, mental, and emotional health. And the first thing that you know, being outside does is your exposure to vitamin D, which is essential for people of color, for black people. Uh, we need this. Now, vitamin D is not a vitamin as we know it. But what vitamin D does is an activator. It activates various hormones in our bodies that allow our body functions to operate properly. When we don't have exposure to vitamin D, we don't necessarily have those ideal interactions in our bodies. Uh, scientists don't know all the things that vitamin D does, especially for African-American bodies, because usually we're not studied in any great um, in depth as, as individuals. But we need to get at least 30 minutes, and I really would say a lot more than that, 30 minutes to three hours daily. I will lean much more close to the three hours uh, or more daily. Um, and that's required for optimal health, especially for African-Americans. Uh, generally, the darker you are, in terms of your pigment, con um, your pigment content, you need to get as more sun. Uh, and lighter you are, maybe less sun, because some of us do have issues with exposure to, um, to the sun and possibly getting sunburned. Um, but generally, after a certain pigmentation level in your skin, you usually don't have any issues with sunburn. Um, and just, you know, most of us who are on this call are probably older or more experienced. Therefore, you know what, what your body can and can't do. Um, I try to stay outside five, six, seven, eight hours. Uh, I, I try to expose myself to the sun as much as possible. Uh, you know, older folks would say, and even probably younger folks, you know, not younger folks, but older folks, and, <laughs> you know, they would say something to the effect of such and such where the sun don't shine. And I really want the sun to shine everywhere on my body because your sun ultimately activates so many different things in your body. Uh, and the nature of us before we came here um, from Africa, even before we became introduced to colonization. So if you were here as indigenous people or from Africa, from other nations, ideally you had very little clothes on during the, the, hot, the summertime or the hotter times uh, because that was how you got the maximum amount of vitamin D. 
and is related to a, a cell phone. If you ever notice when you have a cell phone, I think most of us probably do have cell phones and smartphones. When the battery level gets below like 20%, there are certain functions in that phone that just stop working. There are certain applications you can't use. There are certain things that you're, you have to be much more mindful of in terms of the use of this phone. Once it gets below 10%, more functions are, more, are even more limited. Um, and if you look at African-Americans, if you look at the sun as like our battery or our outlet to keep our battery charged, that's what we need. We need that sun, that solar, that energy that comes from the sun that radiates charges our batteries continually. And the more you don't get it, the more or less optimal your life, your body functions at. So I'd encourage you, one, that's one of the first things we have to do is to get outside. And I mean, to me, nature is the ultimate self-care practice. I know that's a big thing for a lot of individuals is getting self-care um, and receiving self-care. And we understand that taking care of yourself is important. And one of the best ways you can take care of yourself is to go outside and enjoy the sun. In this particular aspect of it, this deals more so with mental health. And soil is a, I got a little blank there because I wanted everybody to shout out what it could be or would be, but I won't make you guess. I'll answer it for you. But soil is an antidepressant. And there's a microorganism in the soil, a bacteria in the soil called Mycobacterium vaccine. Uh, that helps uh, the neurotransmitters in your brain that releases serotonin. And if you know anything about the hormones in our body, serotonin is a relaxing hormone. Helps to lift up your spirits a little bit, a lot of it actually. Um, so when you are, you know, on your wedding day, male or female, serotonin is what is what's submitted in your body when you say I do. It gives you a boost, it gives you a high, it gives you a encouragement to keep going on. It makes you feel better. And soil does the same thing. And notice uh, that I'm saying soil and not the four letter word in agriculture called dirt. Dirt is what happens when you play in the soil, you get dirty. But I rarely do I call the soil dirt. Um, and I see the soil and ultimately land as a part of our mother. Um, in this culture, it's called mother earth. Uh, in various other cultures is usually given a feminine characteristic or name in terms of when we're talking about the earth and the soil. And I would never call my mother dirty uh, or anybody else's mother dirty for that matter. And I wouldn't dare call the earth that we come from dirty either. So it's, we refer to it in the agriculture industry as soil. Try not to use the four, other four letter word, which is dirt. In Ghana, uh, where I spent about five years, uh, we would call it a sase ya. And that means uh, it's almost like a goddess, the goddess earth, a sase. And then Yah, and that would be uh, kind of like the goddess earth. And the, the Thursday is the day of the earth in, Ga in Ghanaian or at least a Khan culture. And this bacterium that's in there, when it's emitted, usually from this digging or smelling, it helps us increase our mood, lifts our spirits, makes us wiser or kinder, more appreciative. Uh, the soil, again, is our mother, not to go into any you know, deeper context, it's good to play with your mother. It's good to listen to what your mother has to tell you. Uh, Dr. George Washington Carver would say some of the secret of his genius, of his uh, understanding was to go outside and talk to the plants, talk to his mother, talk to his brothers and sisters, and it will reveal unto you those secrets. Um, it's an incredible connection once you start to build a relationship with the soil, with the earth. And it's not necessarily you directly talking, but you're thinking, you're meditating, and things seem to come to you a little clearer when you're in the soil. Uh, it's a great way to meditate. It's a great way to let off a lot of steam. It's a great way to, to just find, as a hobby, to release a lot of stress that you have. Just put your hands on the soil, on the ground, any place that is not cement or tar. You wanna really get connected with the actual earth and not the cement or the tar. Uh, and that can be done in a lot of different ways. You have public parks, uh, backyards, uh, front yards, forests, et cetera. Another thing that I always encourage individuals to do is to walk barefoot. Uh, and this is my models here. Um, I got to model for me today, uh, walking barefoot. My son uh, was raised in Ghana, West Africa, and 
it, for life me, I cannot keep shoes on him. Um, the little time that he spent in Ghana, we don't got a little time, five years or so he spent in Ghana. He just, he adopted the culture of walking barefoot. Other people may call this grounding or earthing. And it's another great way <clears throat> to really release a lot of tension in your soul. Uh, the ground is earth, if you know anything about electricity, uh, every electrical socket, every electrical wire needs a ground wire. It has to go into the earth and kind of release the excess energy from that wire. And humans are the same way. So, you know, many of us do not rarely touch the ground because we have on shoes, uh, we have on socks, and we're generally in a, either a car or walking, and we're usually probably on cement or tar when we're walking. So being able to touch the ground helps to release a lot of extra energy in your soul that, you know, pent up stress, energy, et cetera. Um, and there are a number of nerves in your foot that need constant rejuvenation. Um, so this allows you to actually have a sort of massage therapy on your feet. Uh, initially, for anybody who is tender footed, uh, which is most of us who don't walk outside on the ground, uh, it can be challenging. I encourage you to start in the grass and slowly work your way up to not grass. Uh, my son has no problem walking on walking or running or playing soccer on stones, um, grass, in the foot woods, woods, leaves, it doesn't matter. Uh, tars, you know, he, he can, his feet are so accustomed to being on the ground that he can walk pretty much anywhere barefoot. Now, most of us only walk barefoot, usually on the beach. Um, and that's usually saying, which is, you know, it's, it's cool, it's a good start. Uh, but we need to definitely spend some more time with our feet on the ground in our own backyards and, or in a park. Um, and if you don't want to walk, if you sit and just take your shoes off and put your feet on the ground, that's a great part of earthing or grounding or just walking barefoot. <laughs> this is one of those practices I didn't realize I needed until um, I went to Ghana. You know, anytime that you uh, it, growing up, you know, we were told about the tree huggers, which is usually denoted as people, you know, hippies, uh, people from Woodstock, people who had a certain lifestyle. But I found that hugging a tree, I mean, if you can ever recall the movie, The Green Mile, um, with Michael Clark Duncan and Tom Hanks, uh, where the brother was on trial for the, um, it's based on an, another young man's scenario, but that's neither here nor there. The the story in the Green Mile, John Coffey could take away the stress, the pain, the suffering of others uh, in this amazing way, the way they did it in the, cinematically. And that's what I feel every time I hug a tree. If you're stressed, if you're angry, usually I was angry when I was in Ghana. Don't ask me why. Uh, but I was angry or stressed or had a lot on my mind. And I would hug a tree and it would be like all that was taken off my shoulders. It was an amazing phenomenon. They're able to absorb our negative energies or inspire us with some positive energy when we need it. Um, so I encourage you to hug a tree. If you don't want to hug a big tree, start with a small tree, start with a shrub, nothing with pointy needles or anything, but grab a hold of that trunk and wrap your arms around it and see how you feel. You know, especially if you're having not a great day, not a good day, if you're, you know, dealing with some things with your mind, things with your family, you know, things that are troubling you, hug a tree, you know, and kind of just you know, let go and let tree in this scenario you know, really let the, you know, it ain't got to be nothing passionate or, you know, anything <laughs> gross. It just needs to be you wrapping your arms around the tree and embracing for a moment or 10, for 10 seconds or 20 seconds, 30 seconds, and then release. You know, you, you don't have to say nothing to the tree. You ain't got to kiss the tree. You just got to wrap your arms around it and you'll be part of that process of releasing a lot of that stress. Uh, many of us live in a stressful or can live in a stressful environment. And these are just little ways that I find that I can help relieve stress for me um, by being in a rural environment. And another area that I definitely encourage is walking in forest and what they call forest baby, uh, what we just call walking through the woods. Um, and again, it's another aspect of your mental health. Uh, this is me, on the left side uh, is myself and my family farm. Uh, we have a creek on the back of our farm. Um, and it's just nice just to hear the birds, listen to the water run. Uh, many of us who maybe have trouble sleeping in various areas where we are, we generally try to bring in white noise 
And what is white noise is generally sounds of nature. And something about those sounds of nature that gives us a calming effect and helps us to rest, helps us to go to sleep, helps us to meditate. And it's the same thing you can get in any park or not any, maybe not any park, but in most forest, uh, you can find a good forest and walk through there and just listen to the birds, smell, smell the grass, smell the trees, you know, see the salamanders, see the lizards, see the moss. Uh, it's a real sensory, sensory improving uh, experience that makes you much more aware, much more conscious, much more appreciative. And if you get a chance while you're in there, you can combine all the three things I just stated. Uh, you can hug a tree while you're in there. You can walk barefoot for a little while you're in there. Uh, you definitely can get some sun while you're in there. Um, and you'll find, again, as we move forward, we're going to need more of these activities. We're just coming out of a pandemic in which we really couldn't move around as much. And we can see how that affected us mentally, physically, emotionally. Uh, so now that we're moving, it looks like out of the pandemic, we need to really explore our earth a lot more and our environment a lot more. Um, and this is the foundation for what I wanted to share with you today. Uh, last thing that I was going to mention on terms of mental health is improving your gut and brain health. Um, we all will be, and the more time we spend eating fresh natural foods, fresh fruits, we're putting a lot of the bacteria that make up those foods into our bodies. Uh, much of the, let's say for a, a leaf of spinach, probably has about 60,000 different bacteria on it that you can't wash off. Just like I was telling you in the beginning, we are made up of bacteria. So are all the foods that we eat. They're made up of bacteria and cells, many of which can't, we can't wash off. And we don't want to wash off because they wouldn't exist if, we, if they, you could wash them off. Uh, what we wash off of many of those foods are the bad bacteria, the E. coli, uh, the salmonella, the, the strep, um, all those things, and any other non-natural things. Um, but when you ingest these things in a natural form, uh, and I'm sure as young people, we would do things like suck honey suckles or pick blueberries, uh, raspberries, blackberries, you know, as you're walking and you would automatically improve your gut brain health where you would cover your gut with this natural inoculated little bacteria that helps to improve the connection between the gut or the stomach and the brain. Uh, it's said that, you know, the gut is a second brain. I like to say that the heart is the first brain, the gut is the second brain, and the brain is the third brain. But that's you know improving your gut health by eating from you know from your garden that we're going to talk about you setting up in just a moment, as well as uh, eating those wild berries and things like that. You rub it off a little bit, make sure you get all the little extra, you know the, the visible dirt off of it. Uh, but pop it in your mouth and see what happens. And we'll start to improve our health like this a lot more. The next aspect uh, that I get a lot of times for individuals is where do I grow? And in the where, you can do it anywhere. You can grow food anywhere. You can start a garden anywhere. So many people say, oh, well, I, I live in an apartment. I don't have access to land. Well, that's all well and good because you can start inside. You can start on your counter. Uh, what I generally do when I'm working in a counter situation uh, or an inside situation, um, many of us buy salads and we buy salads that are usually in a little container or bowl. And that container or bowl can now, after you finish uh, eating that salad or that spinach, can be utilized as a little small bed that you can grow vegetables in, that you can grow lettuce in, that you can grow salad in. Uh, so after you take that bowl out, I'm going to ask you to take the salad out and eat the salad, wash the, the bowl. Fill it with soil. And when I say soil, I'm really saying the potting mix or the potting soil that you'll get from anywhere. Uh, many people will ask, and we'll go into that a little bit later, but what's the best to use? And the reality is it doesn't matter. Uh, they're all pretty much the same substances. Um, so put in some soil. Use a push pin and put in holes on the sides and the bottom of that, um, of that container. What's that going to do is provide aeration and a place for water to, to flow up. And then from there, cover it. I'm sorry, water it and then cover it with the lid that it came with. And this now becomes a germination chamber to help to germinate the seeds. And once you start to see those seeds pop up, you're ready to go and just keep it under the light and water it every few days. 
and you'll start to have vegetables. You'll start to have some lettuce. You'll start to have some, I don't know, some spinach. Uh, that's what I would encourage to do in those pots. Uh, would be lettuce, would be spinach, would be kale, would be leafy greens. Uh, if you have a balcony, you can stick it outside in the balcony uh, and just monitor the, the moisture and the sun. Uh, plants need three things to grow, and that's usually moisture, sun, and some type of medium, which is usually soil, but it also can be uh, water, it can be rock wool, it can be uh, hemp fabric, it can be, I mean, a whole bunch of different mediums can be utilized uh, for growing vegetables. You can do it in your basement. You can do it on your deck, in your backyard, on your family land. Uh, did he say bury the salad in a pot? No, I didn't say bury the salad in a pot. <laughs> eat the salad. Uh, when you eat the salad, the container that's usually for some of the salad that we buy uh, comes usually in a container. And in that container, after you utilize the, um, the salad, eat the salad, then clean out the, uh, the container, fill it about three quarters of the way with soil, and then place uh, a seed in it, water it. And when I say water, I would say about a cup of water to a cup and a half of water just to saturate the soil, but not to, you know, even if it's gushing, it's okay. Uh, and not gushing, but about a, a cup to no more than two cups of soil. And from there, start the process. Um, Part of the process is getting started. Many of us have a lot of fear about failure, about it's not gonna do right and we don't get it done. So I'm trying to encourage you to make sure you, you get started. That's the first, the, the first plan of success is actually getting started. And when, when should you start planning those things? And I get this question all the time because everybody gets excited right around this time uh, when it gets warm outside, you get spring fever and you want to go out and plant your tomatoes, your melons, because you just got, you know, a great deal on some seeds or you had seeds last year and you really want to get started. And the first thing I tell people is no, not yet. Because what's going to happen is, at least in Virginia, and just listening to where people were from, people are in different uh, agricultural zones. Uh, so as you, if you're further south, this may not apply to you as much. Uh, and I'll try to adjust it according to where I heard different, different demographics. So yeah, know your grow zones for sure. So if you're in, let's say from New York down to North Carolina, uh, I encourage you right now, you can do actually from New York down to Atlanta, or to Florida, you can plant right now collard greens by seed, kale greens, snow peas, or just peas in general, there's no usually summer pea, uh, lettuce, spinach, chart. I put asparagus here. I'll answer, I'll answer that question in a second. It's limited to try to grow um, east facing. I'll answer that question just in a second. Um, spinach, char. I put asparagus here. Asparagus is a different, hmm, it's a different animal because it's a like a root or tuber. You plant it and then it doesn't mature, it doesn't grow or doesn't produce viable asparagus for like the next three years. So it's not a normal style planter like we know. You won't get a, a asparagus crop the first year or the second year that you can eat. Uh, leeks, white potatoes and white potatoes. I mean, most of us growing up, I'm sure, I'm, apparently the national place to put white potatoes was usually underneath the sink or in a drawer in a cabinet. And it was always a time when you went in there and those potatoes are sat in there for a couple of months that they started growing little shoots, long roots. Uh, so they were growing. They were ready to put, be put in the ground then. Uh, so potatoes are easy to root. You cut those eyes off and you plant those and you can start growing tomato, uh, potatoes. Uh, onions as well is relatively easy to start. Uh, and carrots can be done now. These are what I would consider cool weather crops. And why you can grow those now is because they can sustain a freeze if a freeze would come. Um, the collard and the kale, once they, once they get out of like second leaf stage, they germinate and grow up, they're okay to withstand the cold, all right? So most of these crops I'm mentioning now can withstand the cold, can withstand a cold spell. So if it gets 28 degrees, like it's supposed to be at the end of this week or beginning of next week in Virginia, they will still survive. The next set of crops will not survive. And those are the ones that people generally get excited about and want to start planting. And it's always been told to me, at least in this area in Virginia, do not plant these crops until Mother's Day weekend. 
that's in the last time we expect to get a, a, a freeze, uh, what we call a killing freeze or killing frost. Um, it's usually like the second week of May, around May 12th. If you plan it before then, it's, you know, it's a humongous chance that what's gonna happen is those tomatoes or cucumbers or summer squash or peppers or eggplant that you planted and got excited about in March and April are gonna die because they get a, a frost, they're gonna die. And then you go down further south, you're probably more like mid-April because they don't, they're warmer down south. So if you're North Carolina, um, South Carolina, Georgia, you can probably plant roughly second or third week of April. If you're in Florida, you can pretty much plant now for those things. Houston, Texas, yes, you can plant that right now. Uh, so your higher climates, you can plant everything from the, the Mother's Day and the now stuff you can plant right now. Um, and that includes tomatoes, cucumbers, summer squash, peppers, eggplant, melons, cantaloupe, okra. These are the fruiting crops. Most of the fruiting crops are generally of a tropical nature. And because they have a tropical nature, they need warmer climates. Uh, another advantage to this as well is that we get excited about the temperature that's outside, like the ambient temperature. You know, it's 75 degrees, it's 80 degrees. But for plants, we have to be cognizant of the soil temperature. So a lot of times, just like with anything that's of a large mass, it can be very hot outside, but a large body of earth or a large body of water is not gonna cool or heat up as quickly as the general atmosphere that we feel. So that's also why we do Mother's Day as well. And especially for like the sweet potatoes and the melons to plant them around Memorial Day when the soil has heated up quite a bit. You generally want the soil temperature to be around about 65 degrees. Uh, most of us don't carry soil thermometers with us, you know, go figure. Um, so it's a good point of notion just to say, okay, May 28th, you know, Memorial Day, I can start planting my sweet potatoes and my melons and pretty much anything after that. Now, I would not plant the stuff that's in the now because they'll end up bolting. And bolting means they end up going to seed because they're not cold tolerant plants or heat tolerant plants. They're cold tolerant plants. So there are some specific varieties of collars and kale that can kind of deal with the, the heat, but like peas will not do well. There's some you know, varieties of lettuce that may do okay. Spinach won't do well. Chard will do okay. Uh, white potatoes will start to fall back, um, but usually it gets too hot for them. Onions will do okay and carrots will do okay in the heat or the cold. And I, let me see that question that someone had, I wanna just address real quick. Um, when do you stop planting lettuce due to heat and bolting? bolting? Ha. Huh. I would, I would stop planting lettuce in about mid-May, depending on the variety of lettuce that you have. Uh, there are some that are heat tolerant. Uh, and these will probably be more like the romaine types, like a Jericho lettuce, which can grow all year round. We grew that quite a bit in Israel. And it's, it, the Jericho lettuce was created and adapted in Israel where it's pretty much hot uh, during the, that growing season and like very hot, uh, it's grown in a desert. Um, so then that grow, you know, so, there are specific varieties of lettuce that you utilize uh, when you buy certain, you know, I, I look at a lot of seed catalogs. So you have, you know, Jericho and various aspects of Romaine um, that will do okay uh, in the heat and stop it from bolting, bolting. Some of your other lettuces, your oak leaf lettuce, your, your leafy lettuces, I would stop planting those around probably early to mid-May. Uh, lettuce is a fast growing crop. And it's usually not a cut and come again. So once you get that crop up, uh, you know, usually after that it's done anyway. Uh, and lettuce is mostly water. Um, so most of that, you know, it's good to cut and then plant behind it with some of the other things like tomatoes, or cucumbers, or melons. Um, so I'm in Texas. I started last month with seeds. Some are sprouting. Some have a green color to the top of the soil. Should I start over? Mm, it depends. I, I would have to see the green color to figure out what that is. Uh, if it's mold or some type of fungus, yes. If it's this, um, if it's moss, it depends on what you're growing. And if it's, um, if it's like the sprouts, then yeah, you, you should be good. Uh, so I, I would have to see what the green is and what, uh, what's, what's causing that, what's causing more about that. Um, and then thank you for talking about the importance of vitamin D. Vitamin D is playing a major role with COVID-19. Can you tell us more about that? I am not a medical doctor or COVID-19 expert, but I will say 
that vitamin D does a lot to improve or enhance our immune system to help us to fight all certain things. Uh, one of the things that we generally don't, do not get usually in the summertime are, are colds. Like we have allergies and things like that dealing with the pollen, but most of us do not get sick, do not get colds during the summer. Most of us find us getting colds during the fall and winter as the temperatures change. Uh, and a lot of that is one is related to the temperature, but two is also related to our exposure to the sun. You know, during the summertime, we're outside, we're doing various activities, we're cooking out, uh, we, we have on short sleeves, we have on shorts, uh, you know, we are exposing more of our skin to the sun. Therefore, we're building up more of our immunity. And from there, you know, as we go into September going, we start to have on longer sleeves, coats, not exposing ourselves more to the sun and then not being outside as much because it's colder and therefore that usually lowers our immune system, especially for African-Americans. Hope that you know, answers your question. I can't relate, I, I'm not a doctor, so I won't necessarily relate it to how much it can help with, with COVID, but I would still say you can't go wrong if you have a fully charged battery of vitamin D. That is not gonna hurt you in any way, shape or form. Um, and you have an east facing balcony with some northern exposure and wanted to start a small garden, but have heard that south facing is ideal. South facing is ideal, uh, and that's meaning facing uh, south. The south facing idea is that it gets more exposure to sun. Um, you, can off, you can augment that in several ways. Uh, one of those ways can be using a lamp, whether it be a grow lamp, which you can buy from you know any you know, any store that sells things like that. Um, you can also uh, utilize just a regular house lamp, you know, a little student lamp uh, to put it on them to, to assist in getting more sun. If you can't do south, but you can only do east. When you, when do you start? Okay, let me see. And then why my sugar snap pea leaves turn yellow with a soil line, bottom third of the plant. <laughs> I planted them in a container in January, plants are three feet tall. Um, so, I would say they're turning yellow most likely because of a nutrient deficiency. Uh, depending on what's in the soil would help determine how much nutrients they're getting. Uh, most potting soils that we utilize is not soil at all. It's a very fine tree mulch. A lot of the potting soils that we get are really refined or really chopped up barks, bark and trunks of trees. Uh, soil is usually defined as having uh, various component parts, bacteria, protozoa, fungus, nematodes, uh, you know, bacteria. The potting soils that we generally acquire from whatever box store, wherever we get that from, is usually sterile. It has none of those things in it. So by definition, it's not soil. Those things are, that's why they call it potting mix, usually a not soil, uh, or maybe potting soil. So you may have to augment uh, that particular pot with I always encourage molasses with a little bit of water in it. Molasses has a lot of various nutrients in it. Uh, there's some seaweeds that you can add to it, like kelp. Uh, you can add moringa to it. Something that's going to generate more bacteria, more protozoa, more life into the, that pot will help it probably potentially change its color. Um, and last question before I move on. Uh, can you plant basil, oregano, cilantro, parsley in June in Virginia? Yes, you can. Uh, basil does extremely well in the sun as well as cilantro. Uh, parsley does well, uh, well as well. Uh, most of those are very warm herbs. They do extremely well uh, in those environments. They like the sun, they like the heat, and they like some water. You, see, you have a balcony, what really works? Oh, that's a, such a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> A lot of things can work. Uh, it's all about what you're growing in, the amount of exposure to the sun they have. Um, there's some surefire things that you know you can do. I always encourage if you ever go to my my, my website, my son's website, Carter Brothers. Uh, African plants to me do a little better job in terms of dealing with any environment. So like an amaranth uh, will always work. You know, dandelion will always work. There are certain crops that no matter what, they're gonna always grow and find a way to grow. All right, I'm gonna move on to uh, my next part of the slide here. And I wanna give a little credit to my 
I saw a brother here. Oh, and this is a little encouraging words for us all. Never underestimate the importance of small steps. Anybody, and I, I talk to a lot of farmers and potential farmers on a regular basis, uh, a lot of folks wanting to get into agriculture, and what I always tell them to do is start small. You know, no matter the size of your land, no matter the size of your garden, start small. Start with something you can handle and work your way up. Now, if you start with these big steps, you can see in this demonstration here, it's a different reality. Um, it's a, it makes it a little more challenging, which can be a little more discouraging. And another, you know, some words of encouragement is don't let the fact that you don't know what you're doing stop you from doing anything. We all start with, uh, we all start everything not knowing what we're doing or not having any experience in the activity at least once in our lives. We didn't know how to walk, read, talk, date, marry, divorce, work, drive, play, cook, bake, et cetera. It was always the first time. And through the act of doing, we, we learn how to do it. Uh, failure only happens when we don't try. And you may not get it right the first time, but eventually you'll get it and you'll get the hang of it. And for our people as well, just always remember the color of Dr. George Washington Carver's thumb. It wasn't green. It was brown and probably a shade or two darker or lighter than yours. So we all had the ability because we all have a Dr. George Washington Carver thumb to be able to grow and grow and grow. I'm gonna give a shout out to my brother, um, to Ron Chavis here. Uh, I'm using a little bit of his, of his presentation for our next part of the presentation. I'm gonna stop my share here so I can go on to his presentation real quick. Uh, to give a little more insight about what it is, uh, how to kind of grow some things to kind of answer some of those questions as well. So give me one second, let me share that screen and we're gonna jump into that as well. And check out Deron Chavis, he's out of Richmond, Virginia. Awesome brother, does a lot of teaching uh, in agriculture. Um, and, and he does a little boot camp called the Southside Growers Boot Camp Academy. Well, Southside Growers Academy, and this is part of the boot camp. Um, I'm gonna go through some seed starting, some basic things that you can do and kind of give you some general ideas about some basic things with seed starting. And hopefully next year when we do this, Michelle, we can do it in person somewhere. So we can have it in real time um, and have our hands in the soil. That would be great, Duran. Um, I said Duran, that'll be what great. What you call Michael. me? Oh well, I, you talked about Duran's, <laughs> yeah, you talked about this. I actually went to Duran's, um, he had a food garden where you can put, you know, get food. And, and so I was thinking about that. So sorry. Sorry, Michael okay. Carter. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Now, it says a compliment to be called by my brother's name. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you. So this is a little bit about the seed. And you can see the different aspects and type of the seed. And it's a little more technical than maybe you may want to know but these are different parts and parts of the seed as it grows. And it's just like from a, the seed of a man into a woman and the earth is the womb. And then from there, you start to get the umbilical cord. You start to get the other parts of that seed forming into what we know as a baby or a child. And that's where all that seed is. Seed is, is a vegetable. Yeah, <laughs> it's a vegetable seed. Um, so there's a seed coat, the young shoot, the lateral roots, uh, the leaves, and this is from a P. And this is different types of propagation that you can have in terms of growing. If you look at this ginger, and this is a piece of ginger, you can see ginger, this we call this a rhizome. And from that rhizome, you'll see the green shoots starting to come out. The rhizome allows for it to grow from different parts of that one, one piece of rhizome. So you have a whole bunch of different plants being able to pull up. So you here, I think you can see one, two, three, four different sprouts. And you can literally cut those sprouts off or cut around those sprouts and have four different plants. And there are numerous plants like that. Uh, the sweet potato is very similar to this. The potato is similar to this. The taro, the cassava, uh, the spurs are the tubers or rhizomes that are like this, even bananas are like this. Propagation, asexual versus sexual, i.e. from plant cuttings or from pollination of flowers. And this is the first part of germination. So you can see the seed, 
Once the seed is exposed to water in a medium of some sort, the germination process, process starts and it'll start to shoot a uh, root down first. And seeds have an amazing ability to be able to, turn, to be able to tell which side is up. So they'll redirect the energy if they feel like they're right side up. So, you know, you can plant things upside down, but most seeds had the enactability to be able to get itself situated no matter what we do. Because if you remember that seeds in its natural form are, you know, usually coming from a plant or being dropped by an animal that's not us or uh, being blown through the air. So when they land, they're not being planted or landing correctly every time they land. But for them, there is no correct. They will figure out how to get upright or, or in a position to, to root. And a lot of them will, you know, will turn around, will move around, let the wind blow them or just, you know, change their course. And instead of the bottom being the top, the top is down the bottom and they'll send out roots to the, what they would refer to as the top, but it, they'll make it work. Because the idea is they want to live, they want to grow, they want to germinate, they want to become whatever they kind of seed that is. And there are numerous types of seeds, and this is probably where you get the most questions. And uh, you try to help people understand. Now, I'm going to try to eliminate a lot of the questions here by getting rid of a lot of myths that any seeds that you get, that you buy from the store, any store, is not gonna be genetically modified. Uh, GMO seeds are not sold to average people. They're not sold to regular consumers. And there are only about six crops that are actually genetically modified, uh, six to seven crops, I think, at this point, that are genetically modified. Um, and again, they're not sold to consumers, they're not sold to gardeners, and are not sold to you know, any of the, the big box stores as something for you to grow in your garden. So the, the six genetically modified crops are cotton, soybeans, corn, sugar beets, canola. Ah, ah, I'm missing, am I missing some one? Uh, and potatoes, they do have some potato varieties now that may be GMO. And am I missing another one? I think that's it. So I say cotton, canola, soybeans, Corn, sugar beets are your main genetically modified crops. Cotton is used for cotton, the textiles was cotton seed oil. Soybeans are used for soybean oil and inks and a whole bunch of other industrial products. Corn is used for ethanol, for gas, uh, as, as well as other industrial products like high fructose corn syrup. Um, sugar beets is used for the white sugar. Wheat is not a genetically modified crop. Um, there are hybrids which is a different reality. Hybrids, anytime you see a hybrid, hybrids will always be, oats are not genetically modified as well. Oats or neither one of those are genetically modified. They are hybrids and they are conventional. And conventional means that you utilize um, standard practices in terms of, um, what's the word? In terms of spraying. So conventional means you utilize insecticides, fertilizers, um, and other practices in your agriculture. Uh, a hybrid means that it's a cross between two of the same species of plants. So it would imply when you have something like a seedless grape, that would be more of a hybrid. Or a seedless watermelon is more of a hybrid than it is an actual, uh, it's not genetically modified. Uh, certified organic means that it's usually grown under organic conditions as opposed to conventional conditions. And then open pollinated, means that it's able to um, <laughs> able to fertilize itself. It's not a hybrid, um, which means that it does it, it's going to reproduce after itself. So you can save seeds from open pollinated seed and grow those seeds again. If you save seeds from a hybrid plant, there's a chance that it will not have the same characteristics as the initial plants. And then when you're going to open pollinate more, you can go into heirloom crops. Uh, yeah, I should be able to, I mean, I'll send my part to the through email. I will not send Deron's part uh, just because that's his intellectual property, but I will send that and I'll give a brief overview of these things as well via email. Um, and then, you know, so you have heirloom seeds. Heirloom seeds date back to 1940 or before, which means they existed before the, what they call the Green Revolution. And those are donated, those are some of your older uh, seed varieties that our grandfathers 
grandmothers would have utilized in their gardens or their farms. And so Deron has here why I grow heirlooms. Heirlooms are ideally the best things to grow because the genetic diversity is what's more apropos to our genetic structure. These are the things that our grandmothers and grandfathers and great grandmothers and great grandfathers were raised on. Uh, and these crops, particularly to me, to me anyway, are healthier than some of the other crops um, because the genetic structure is a lot different. Uh, they haven't been modified for taste or for, per, for shipping or logistics. A lot of the hybrids, a lot of the other conventional things were usually crossed either naturally, either on purpose or on accident for marketing purposes. And very rarely, if ever, for nutritional purposes. Mm, Ms. Fendiva, Sedana, uh, seed starting materials, you need seeds, germination mix, and you see you didn't have soil, but a germination mix. Uh, light containers, tags for labels, watering can and spray bottles. And using warm water or just any type of water, pour from your tap. Uh, keep the soil moist to the touch, but do not make it soaking wet. Generally, what we do most cases is you see how this flat is covered, you know, it has it's full of soil or potty mix. You sprinkle the seeds on there on top and sprinkle a little more of the potty mix on, on the bottom. When you're planting seeds, you don't want to plant any deeper than the, the width of that seed. And most seeds that you're planting aren't they, they, they aren't uh they aren't wide if you think about carrots cabbage mustards broccoli cauliflower all those seeds are very small seeds the biggest seeds are the most vegetable seeds that we have are usually like a chard or a beet uh and even then you don't plant them too deep uh you never plant you know i would say no more than like a million you know two or three millimeters you know just spring on top of the soil and cover it up uh with some of the uh from with some soil and then water it. And once that contact happens with the water uh, and the and the seed meat or the, the soil medium, uh, germination will, will start to will start. Once germination starts, they grow up, keep light on them. Once they get um, once they start germinating, prior to germination, you don't need any light. Uh, they germinate in the dark. And then once they show a sprout or a leaf, then you open that up and let them get light. This is another aspect of what we generally experience right now is hardening off. And that's when you lead your, when before, right before you get ready to transplant these seeds outside, if you're starting from inside, you take them outside for you know a few hours, let them get a feel of the natural environment and bring them back in. And most people do this for a couple of days and bring them back in, you know, take them out for a couple of hours, just kind of increase the hours outside every day until you get ready to transplant. And then before you get ready to transplant, keep it out for overnight. Um, but if you keep it outside overnight, you want to ensure that it's probably above 55 degrees at night because you don't want to, to get too shocked. Because these are, I mean, in reality, these are just babies. These are infants at this point in terms of the life of, of that plant. Some common issues that you may have, as mentioned uh, earlier, someone was talking about the green leaves or the pale green leaves, a lack of nitrogen. Um, a lot of people have this issue where they have long, long stems we call them leggy seedlings uh and they they have they're very long and they kind of they're stretching out toward light or new or they're not getting enough sun enough light um and that generally happens when you are uh using like a fluorescent light and it's too far away so if you're losing using like the light you know in the ceiling of your of, of a room that's usually too far away unless they, it's directly in front of it and use that still too far away. That's why I encourage you to use lamps as opposed to like ceiling lights. Uh, and then try to get them, if you can, to be about two to four inches above the top of the plant. That's the ideal ratio because the light that we get from fluorescent lights and other lights are not the same spectrum as sunlight. Sunlight has a whole nother UV spectrum that provides the type of sustenance these plants needs. The artificial light that we get from the lamps and other things do not provide that full sustenance. Um, lack of nutrients in the soil, as I mentioned, the, what we get from the, wherever we get our potty mix from is not soil. It doesn't have the nutrients, doesn't have the bacteria, the protozoa, the fungi, the, the millipedes, the earthworms, et cetera, in there that helps with the nutrient cycling. So they don't have anything to feed off of. All those things that we see in the soil is what the plants feed off of. 
It's a food, it's a soil food web and everything is living off everything else. Uh, and then over watering, if you give it too much water, it's gonna drown and it's going that's just reality of anything. So be mindful that the plant roots have to breathe just like we have to breathe. You know, we can wash our face, get the dirt off our face, but we still need to breathe. You can't keep our heads underwater. And that's what happens if you overwater them. And it's, it's just, you generally wanna let the, the soil medium be moist, not wet. And just kind of check it. If the top is dry, that's okay. Put your finger inside your pot or whatever else. If it's moist in there around the root zone, that's good. That's how you want to keep it and wait for that to kind of dry out and then put some more water in it. Uh, and if it's too much water, you got you encourage sticking outside. If it's too much, too much water, drain it off, uh, poke some holes in the pot or you know, take something and get the water out the pot. Um, or even add more soil to it to kind of suck up the excess water. All right, well, that's that part there. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna start answering some questions if there's any more. All right, all right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael Carter Jr., not Deron. So I know both of you all. And, and so, <laughs> you know, it, gar the, garden, the gardening groups are very small. So my, yes. my apologies for calling you someone else's name. It's okay. Um, I want to- it's a compliment. Um, it's a company. That's great. It is. Both of you all are very smart and intelligent in the gardening realm. And I appreciate both of you all. Before I go any further and before you go any further, we're going to continue on. I know it's 802. We're going to continue on with answering questions. I want to give a shout out to our Asala branches. We have the Edna B. McKenzie branch here from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, at um, President Ronald Saunders. We have the Philadelphia Heritage Asala branch. President Miss Regina Vaughn. And we also have the Tampa, Florida Asala branch here, as well as the Rochester, New York branch here in attendance. And I want to say thank you. That I see a lot of the attendees here, and I want to say thank you for joining us. We try to um, join each other's uh, webinars as much as we can to support each other. Um, the other piece is, I went through the chat, we have people from Kentucky, Mississippi, Missouri, Texas, Black, um, uh, Virginia, Buckingham, Blacksburg, Maryland, Henrico County, Virginia, Chesapeake, New York, Indiana, Georgia, Tennessee, Michigan, and if I missed anybody else, put it in the chat. We have people from Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated here, AARP, and many other organizations. So we just wanna say thank you for joining us. We are now going to answer some questions here. So Michael, do you wanna read them or do you want me to read them out for you? You can read them because I can't find them. All uh, right. So, <laughs> yeah, I know that you have like many, um, you have two, well, he has two um, open face, I'm not Facebook, but Zooms, because he is making sure that his internet does not cut off because he lives in a rural area of Virginia with lots of good food. So we can't wait to do that in-person event. Um, we talked about the sugar snap peas le um, leaves during the yellowing. So you did that one. Um, we talked about having something on the balcony that what really works. Um, oh, here's a good one. I seem to have an open overpopulation of red worms. Is there such a thing of too much soil activity? That's from Carmen. Great question, Carmen. The, the, the scientific answer to that is no. Uh, when you have red worms in your soil, that is so much like, and it's like, can you have too much joy? Can you have too much happiness? that's what they're bringing. They're bringing life, joy, happiness. Can you have too many babies? It's like, you know, this is so much, uh, you know, you should consider yourself blessed if you have a whole lot of micro microbial activity. That means you have a lot of nutrition going on in your soil. And that's the soil you want to plant in. That's the soil you want to eat from. Uh, that was the soil that I great grandmothers and great grandfathers had and raised themselves off to be, you know, living in the 90s and the 100s. Um, well, generally, we could say you got, you know, um, I always hear because I'm a vegan, you know, but Graham, which is my great grandmother, she ate chicken, she ate pork. No, she she did. She ate from a certain soil and that soil helped to sustain her life because that's what the, you know, the pig ate from her soil, the cow ate from her soil, the chickens ate from her soil. It didn't eat from a feedlot in Wisconsin or Idaho or Kansas. 
Uh, so it's a different type, you know, that, that the soil life and the soil bacteria is the key to nutrients and nutrient density. That's a whole nother conversation and lecture, but nutrient density is good. So if you have a red worms, uh, would it be red wigglers? Would it be European night crawlers, would it be African night crawlers? Superb. Keep up the good work. And that, you know, I, I think about um, maybe about last, maybe two years ago, I saw a, you lecturing regarding composting and having mm -hmm. worms in there. And because of you, I literally started to compost. So, um, and knowing that worms are very good in compost. So when I see them, I get really happy. And when I see them on the ground, I throw them in my, my compost. So um, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Phyllis asked a question. She said, what do you do for butterfly lava? She, uh, they always get in my parsley. But about larvae? Larvae, uh-huh. Um, see, the best way to, they always get in your parsley. Are they eating your parsley? They're not eating your parsley because uh, they usually, most caterpillars and things like that, because butterfly larvae, uh, we, a caterpillar turns to a butterfly. And the caterpillars are the worst things to have in a garden. They will wear out, they eat everything, everything uh, <laughs> with no mercy. Um, what we've generally done is different ways you can do it. Um, generally get a spray bottle of some sort. Uh, you can sprinkle it or dust it with diametaceous earth. That's a little challenging because usually they're on the un underside of the, of the leaf. One of the things we used to do in West Africa was use like black soap or non-scented Clear soap, would it be Dr. Bonner's or uh, palm olive, something with no scent on it, you know, one of those clear soaps, even a, a brown soap or black soap. Uh, put hot pepper in there, cayenne pepper. Two to three tablespoons of cayenne pepper. Uh, chop up a clove of garlic. Uh, most people don't have neem oil, so that's a good, that's a good way to start because what the pepper does is burns the backs or the bodies of those insects. The caterpillars are soft-bodied insects which means that the hotness, and most caterpillars, just like most worms, they taste with their entire body. So imagine you tasting, you know, not from head to toe tasting cayenne pepper, not just in your mouth, but your eyes now are filled with cayenne pepper, your underarms are filled with cayenne pepper, your toes, your legs, you know, and you have little scrapes in your body. So it's like open cuts all over your body with cayenne pepper. That's kind of what you would do. It is poor for caterpillars, but I mean, it's, 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 they know better. The caterpillar is supposed to know better. They go to caterpillar school. They are told don't mess with the insect. I mean, so much other stuff they can eat, uh, you know, but, uh, but that's the best way to do it to kind of deter them. It may not kill them, but it definitely would knock them off. Um, there are other ways that I mean, we use neem oil as a deterrent. Uh, you can pick them off. That's very tedious. Yes. Um, but that diamond tastes earth and like a, pepper. There's other sprays that can be utilized from organic stuff. Okay. Cayenne may kill, kill the caterpillars. I'm trying to be nice and diplomatic. <laughs> Maya said poor caterpillars. Yeah. yeah Dura <laughs> would say that cayenne pepper does kill the caterpillars. Yeah. You know, I'm a little, you know, because it's my occupation, I get a little bothered and I've had episodes with the CB, uh, what's called the imported cabbage worm on my farms. And yeah, so we don't have the best relationship. So I'm not, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's yeah. just and i don't know what those green things are called that are i mean they you, you don't I, I forgot what they're called and i think you talked about them before but they eat like your whole crop in probably two seconds um they're huge and those are another things i use neem oil on um and i get neem oil i go to amazon and you know just order yeah. it and, and put it in some water and spray bottle it um, that's the best way you can get rid of it and neem oil is a great uh, insecticide. It usually doesn't kill the insects, but neem has a compound in it called azaractin. Azaractin in insects causes deformities in their offspring. So when they smell it, it becomes uh, known to that thing that I need to get away from it because this is gonna have an issue in my reproductive cycle. So we encourage the caterpillars or the aphids or the um, white flies and other things to stay away from it. It's not 100% foolproof, but it does discourage them a lot. So neem oil is a great product to use. One, I would say one tablespoon to about 16 ounces of water. 
and it's N-E-E-M, so Darlene mm -hmm. I, um, Irving, so how do you spell it? N-E-E-M. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so we want, let me go back and uh, Darlene Irving also asked, how do you get rid of fungus gnats and groundhogs? Jeez, groundhogs, it's called efforts. <laughs> All right. A lot, uh, you know, and we always have, I get comments like this or questions like this all the time uh, with the groundhogs. And there's always one person that says a 22, you know, <laughs> a shotgun. Um, they are, groundhogs are very difficult and to manage because they have no, if you ever seen the movie Caddyshack, that's a very good example of how groundhogs do and are. Uh, they go in and just kind of raid everything with no respected person. Um, I've seen dogs be able to kind of mess with them a little bit and get them off. But again, they travel on the ground. So if you're doing like carrots and things like that, they can eat. There are little uh, various from various home improvement stores, little stakes that you can put in the ground to kind of send off a pheromone or a scent that kind of keeps them away. Um, I haven't discovered a the other another deterrent outside of directly um, giving them what's affectionately called lead poisoning. Um, that's, uh, that, that will get rid of them because they have mammals and they don't really have a natural predator in that space. Uh, and you don't want to necessarily bring the predators into your garden. You don't want to bring a fox or a wolf to come deal with the, you know, in your, in your heat community. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, and most people you really can't, you know, we live in a rural area where you can just shoot guns whenever you feel like it. In an urban or suburban area, it's probably a lot more frowned on. There's also traps um, that you can bait the traps, hopefully catch the groundhog and then take them to a park somewhere and let them, and let them free. Uh, and then fungus nets. Fungus nets usually deal with a lot of, uh, too much water or moisture. Uh, the first thing I would do is a fan to try to get some airflow going in. Uh, if that's, I'm assuming that's probably inside. Uh, if it's outside, again, the neem oil um, or the pepper, the cayenne pepper. All right. So the um, there's a, what about the gnats that don't get attracted? I, I don't know whether these are fungus gnats, but they're not attracted to apple cider vinegar and the Dawn dish detergent. What are they called? Okay. <laughs> Those are the ones that kind of run um, around in your face and they like mess with you and they're like, hey, I'm still here. Those sure. are the OG nets. Okay. Nets. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. Um, there are little things that can be done as well. If you remember, like when we grew up, um, so when I grew up anyway, you had those slide traps that would you hang, put in the ceiling and let it yes. drop down. There are some yellow sticky cards, again, that you can buy from your you know thing. Uh, the yellow sticky cards would have a little, you know, they're about this big and they're sticky. Yes. So most of those insects they've discovered are usually yellow or like, the color of yellow and attracted to yellow uh, and they will stick to them. And once they stick to them, they're pretty much it's a done deal. Uh, they're not going anywhere else for a while. Um, Perfect. Yeah, those those work. You can create your own or you can buy some online. There are some uh, non-toxic like, um, I'm gonna say glues, but like adherent traps that you can utilize for this purpose. So if you get like yellow construction paper and cut them in squares, you know, and put them in your, you know, either in your garden on a stake or hang them from a tree or something. Uh, with this, you can, they'll fly to it, catch it, they'll probably catch some aphids, some moths, some butterflies, uh, and a lot of other things that may bother your garden. Plants are, I mean, insects are very much attracted to colors. Mm -hmm. You know, so certain colors that all insects attract to, because if you look at what's out there, what's outside now, at least in Virginia, is daffodils. What color are daffodils? Yellow. Yellow. Uh, the, you know, so you have, you know, so you'll see bees around them. You'll see, you know, various other flying insects around them because they're just starting to come out, and that's the first thing that's provided them nectar. So that's why they're attracted generally to yellow because yellow usually indicates that this plant or this substance is providing me nectar or pollen for my future food. For you know, Perfect. so it's kind of utilizing this, the science of you know nature. We have another question. Could you offer seed or seedling suggestions for non-Western crops that are most delicious and beneficial for very dark melanated folks? 
Who asked, who asked that question? That's like somebody I planted in this. <laughs> that's, 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 I think that's Carmen, Dr. Carmen Foster. <laughs> All right, I think. Dr. Carmen it's Foster, Carmen. I appreciate that question. That's a great question. Let me tell you something here, Carmen. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Foster, uh, there are numerous plants, and I, this is a, a philosophy that we're really promoting on our farm called Eating for Your Ethnic Type, and really promoting these plants, uh, non westernized plants plants that come from the African continent. Uh, you can go to carterbrothers.net, which is our son's, my son's company. Um, I encourage amaranth or callaloo seed, uh, Nigerian spinach or celosia seed, jute leaf. Oh, let me take that back. Jute leaf is not as delicious, okay? Uh, so Nigerian spinach, amaranth are very good. There's another leaf that most of us don't, are maybe familiar with, but do not utilize, utilize eat it. And that's sweet potato leaves. Sweet potato leaves are very much edible, extremely tasty. Sweet potato leaves grow plentifully. I mean, you if you have two sweet potatoes that you plant in your garden, you have enough probably sweet potato leaves for the rest of the summer. They produce a whole lot and they are very, they're highly nutritious, both in vitamin A, vitamin C and iron. Um, and what I love about all these plants um, is that they don't take a lot to grow. So they're drought tolerant. They use it flood tolerant. They don't have a lot of insect pressures, which means insects don't bother them too much because nutritionally they're very sound. So you can get amaranth um, and you can get amaranth and what's the other one? Uh, sorry, Nigerian spinach uh, from my website, uh, carterbrothers.net. I would encourage you to go to sladefarms.net, S L A D E F A R M S dot net or Southern Exposure. Yes, deer do love sweet potato leaves. <laughs> so you get that first. Uh, uh, you go to Southern Exposure City Exchange to get uh, sweet potato slips. That's a Louisa, Virginia, or Mr. Slade himself. Slade Farms, uh, that's another uh, black farmer out of uh, Surrey County, Virginia, uh, our old family friend. He is probably the godfather of sweet potatoes. Uh, and he does a great job, has about maybe 16 different varieties of sweet potatoes. Um, and this becomes, again, those are the three that I would say are by far the best tasting um, and they won't do you wrong. I can give you some other ones, but they're not maybe going to taste as good. And I want to start you off with the good ones first. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So Maya asks, what is a sucker? My dad keeps talking about removing suckers. <laughs> oh, okay. So he's talking about tomatoes. So... When you're dealing with tomatoes, and I'm gonna try to give an example, I don't have any tomatoes right here. So I'm gonna use my hand as a tomato plant, right? All right, so here, jeez, okay. All right, you have a lateral stem. You see my, my this finger here that's moving is the stem of the tomato, all right? Yeah, that's the stem. And then the tomato will grow a, I'm gonna do this way. Jeez, okay, we'll grow a branch right here, all right? I'm really struggling with this. <laughs> All right, we'll grow out a branch right here. And this branch here, yeah, use the armpit instead. Thank you. <laughs> so right here is where you'll get fruit for the tomatoes. Okay, this, this particular branch right here, this initial one is immediately off of the stem will give you fruit. Initially though, you will have, and especially in what they call indeterminate tomatoes, tomatoes that grow up not determinate tomatoes. And you gotta know which tomato you're dealing with, indeterminate or determinate. So you, you, if it's indeterminate tomatoes, they're gonna have suckers. And the sucker's gonna grow right here in between the two. And the sucker is not gonna produce fruit. It's just gonna be a leaf and take up the energy that's used to produce fruit. So we always pull out the suckers because it's not gonna produce fruit. So the sucker is the node or the branch that's growing in between the node, between the branch, uh, the stem and the branch. And I hope I, you can yes. make up that. Yeah. Perfect. You All did right. a perfect, I remember just learning about that. And you, I just picked them off and they're, they're very easy yeah. to pick off. But they they're very easy suck. to pick off. They'll suck everything yeah. out of your tomato and your tomatoes won't grow. As but well only as on indeterminate plants. And indeterminate plants grow up. They, you know, they are, the determinate plants, you never want to do that because they're going to produce on every branch to permanent plants to grow. And so you just need to check with, uh, it should say on the, the plant package that it's indeterminate or determinate. Right? 
and that's a whole different that's a different um um webinar determinate yeah and determinate <laughs> plans. there's a nuances so, within agriculture that just i mean and i did i mean it's just nuances yeah so thank you i appreciate that mm -hmm. um and i'm sure uh i can't see who asked that question but they appreciate it too um, and her father knows what it is, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, when can you plant ginger? Mm, good question. Uh, you generally can plant ginger now. The thing with ginger is that you don't harvest it until probably the year after. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and depending on where you're growing it at, um, would determine, you know, it's tricky. A lot of people grow it in bags or containers. You can, so you can plant it now. Right, keep it in containers, let it grow, let it grow, let it grow. Then when it gets cold outside, bring it inside. Okay. And then, you know, once you're ready to harvest, you know, probably later on that year, you can harvest it. Usually they're ready to harvest when the, the stems die off or die back. So they start to turn brown and then fall down. And then that's when it's time to harvest. Good to so know. So ginger and turmeric are in the same family. So they, same exact way to grow those. All right. So Mildred asks, what do you do if the seed becomes exposed when watering? I guess this is right when you're planting it and you just put a, a light coating of um, soil over top of it. So what do you do when the seed becomes exposed when watering? Oh, that's fine. It'll bury down or even if it was, you know, what I generally do, if that happens, I can see it, take my finger, and it's push it down in the soil. And it's utilized just the, you know, usually no, no deeper than probably the end of my nail bed, just as far as I push it down. I just wanted to make sure it makes contact with the soil first and foremost, and then I don't want to bury it too much. I don't want to take it down to my knuckle or my, you know, you, know, you don't want to take it down too deep. Okay. So there's another question. Maya said, watering for potted plants. How do you know when to water? She's struggling with this. Part of plants, again, your finger is your best tool when you're dealing with stuff on the inside. Stick your finger inside the pot. If it's dry all the way down, like you pull it out and it's like dry, brittle, then you need to water. If it's moist, when you stick your finger in and say down to your first knuckle, first or second knuckle, let's go second knuckle. I'm going to say that's a knuckle right there. So down to there, you know, you get your finger that part deep. And if it's moist, when you put your finger in there, it doesn't need water. Um, if it's not moist, then you need to put water in there. And then, you know, plants, house plants, you got to understand that house plants aren't natural in terms of the way they generally acquire nutrients and water is from the outside and they get what they need when they need it. So depending upon you now to figure out when they supposed to get something is a different change of pace for the house plant. And there are certain plants that are much more fickle than others that need certain amounts of light, that need certain amounts of water, that needs, you know, if you have an orchid that has a whole nother set of criteria and a whole other set of medium that it needs to grow in. Now you can't even use a standard, you know, soil medium with orchids. And then if you have an aloe vera, that's a whole nother situation. If you have a banana plant, like I have some in my house, uh, if you have a snake plant, you know, he don't need much of anything. He just need good thoughts, some prayers, and probably go with you to church every morning, every Sunday, and he'll make it. So they have different plants that do different things. So it's good to know exactly what plant you're growing, uh, and then try to go to some of those ones who are not necessarily as pretty, but are much more durable in terms of growing them if you're having trouble with some of the other ones. Because some of these tropical plants, I mean, it's, just, it's a tricky scenario. I, I, I've killed a few myself and I you, you know, wow okay I mean I'm just being honest I mean yeah you know, yeah that's, that's, you know okay. because the reality is I say if, I, if I'm traveling and I don't give instructions to water the plant you're so I come back and I try plants. to save yeah. it yeah yeah because they may be they may be traveling with me so you mm -hmm. know like I know I lost several plants this January because Are you still with us? Well, you're on mute. You're on mute now. On the other, we can still see you.
There My bad, go. I'm coming. Can you hear me? Uh-huh, we can hear you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It's Orange, Virginia. That's fine. We understand. Yeah, it's, somebody called me and actually knocked me offline. Was, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. And I couldn't tell them nothing. You know, so anyway, so I'll take it from here. Uh -huh. So, you know, if you do a snake plant, if you do an aloe vera plant, um, there's the, uh, what is this thing called that I'm looking at right now? Uh, a lily of the valley plant. Mm -hmm. Some of those are a little easier to manage. Um, go with those. Another great house plants are generally the cactus varieties. Uh, they don't require a lot of water. Uh, and I was saying before, I guess, that I lost several plants um, in January when we had the, we had a blackout here in Virginia and it was cold. And I went to a hotel for eight days and nobody watered my plants. I mean, granted, my house probably got down about 40 degrees. So that's how I lost a couple of plants because it just, you know, things happen. But I didn't lose any snake plants. All right. They don't die, they right. multiply. I'm going to do one more question and then we will wrap up. There's this question about how do you get rid of earwigs? Uh, I would say definitely the same uh, way. Um, in terms of the um, pepper, now I always use pepper and the neem oil. Um, they are also not going, I guess, too deep because there's like beneficial insects that you can utilize to fight them off. You kind of create like a war of insects where you can get, you can acquire ladybugs or predatory wasps and things like that to bring in. But I mean, from a garden standpoint, there's no need to get that involved in nature. Uh, uh, but there are, um, I would dare say again, the, uh, the neem oil and the pepper is a good way to get started with those, to try to address them there, as well as the, uh, the yellow carts, the sticky carts. Uh, most flying insects will end up flying there as opposed to other things, as well as crawling insects will, will find its way over to there because again, they're trying to pollinate, get pollen and nectar. So you'll get rid of thrips, ear, rib, ear, ear wings, uh, ear wigs, uh, white flies, or catch some that way as well. So those little card traps that you can get from any online with the stickiness is about $20 for like a pack of a hundred. Oh, wow. Yeah. Watering yeah. yellow card stickies tonight yeah. <laughs> because they are around some of my um, seedlings. So. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Michael Carter Jr. for all of your insightful information. We are just full of knowledge right now. And so, I mean, I really enjoy you coming on. I am not the um, gardening um, farmer type, you know, because I, you know, work full time, but in my free time, I do that. So listening to you, it helps me, you know, with like the neem oils and learning more things so that I can have my garden grow really nicely this spring and summer. Uh, next, we will have Michael Carter Jr. on April the 26th. It's a, another one of our, our Cultivate and it's a part of our Africulture Afri series. It's our third webinar for our, our, from our Africulture series. Michael Carter Jr. will be here again and sharing his knowledge and expertise and we are excited about that. We will, on Sunday, we have a Sunday sit-in. And this Sunday sit-in, it's celebrating Women's History Month, saluting African-American veterans of the Vietnam War with filmmaker Ann James. I put the, um, the link in the uh, chat so that you can um, register. And if you don't have the link, you can always email us at A-S-A-L-H-R-V-A info at gmail.com or go to our Facebook page and you can register there. And we also will be partnering with AUGS, the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society of Richmond. So our Saturday event will be March 26th and we'll be talking about the Jackson Project. The Jackson Project is a part of Jackson Ward, which is a very famous place in Richmond, Virginia. So if you want to learn more about that, go to our Facebook page at A-S-A-L-H-R-V-A on Facebook. And that is it. We have had a plethora of information from Michael Carter Jr. I am so happy you all have stayed on with us. We wanted to make sure that we've asked, we, 
answered all of your questions. And for you and for all of you all that wanted to get those links, we will send out information tomorrow um, regarding this. Uh, here, we have the, the recording here as well as the links. So if you have any questions anytime, we're here. And if you want to join Asala RVA, please do so. We'll be doing this an in-person live. I can't wait. We don't know when, but when we will, we will invite you all to come join us. Well, it is now 831. We want to wish you all an enjoyable evening. Thank you, AARP Virginia, for always being a part and supporting us. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a great one. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Thank you.